The greatest mission of all mankind, the greatest mission that has ever been seen, the great mission of Christmas. Think about the word mission. Um, I want you to think about the context in which we often use the word mission. Oh, yes, if you don't have an outline, please lift your hand, and these gentlemen will be glad to give you one. The way we study the Bible, you will definitely need one this morning. Just lift your hand, and they'll give one to you. Think about the word mission with me. I want you to think a little bit about the space program. We often have talked about uh, missions in light of um, the Gemini project or the Apollo project or the shuttle project. It would be STS-151 or whatever it was. Um, all of these missions that are, that are going out very boldly to accomplish a purpose. We not only think about the word mission in light of space uh, work, we also think about it in light of military. Our military has various missions that it goes on to accomplish certain purposes. Uh, some of those missions are offensive, some of them are defensive, um, but the mission aspect is that it has a very particular purpose and it has to take a full attention and a full commitment in order for it to be completed. This morning I want us to look at the greatest rescue mission of all time. Some of you have been alive for various rescue missions that you've seen. In World War II, there was the great rescue mission that, made, that was made very popular this last year. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Think about the movie uh, that I think Nolan Ryan made. What was the name of that movie? Dunkirk. Some of you saw that, where there were thousands and thousands of British troops that were stranded on the beach of northern France and the German occupied forces were pressing them to the ocean or to the channel. There was nowhere for them to go. And then there was this massive mission of rescue. At first it started with military ships, and then before very long it was the local fisherman and the local yachtsman that was running his boat across the English Channel, the 31 miles there, um, to the area not far from Calais where they would rescue thousands upon thousands upon thousands of troops. We also think about the raid on Entebbe where there were hostages um, and a radical raid to free those hostages. We've seen other times during the Iran um, revolution that there were 50, Amer more than 50 American hostages where there, were a, there was a rescue attempt um, it was a failed attempt, but nevertheless, it was very instrumental in setting the way the American military would seek to go into rescue. I remember back several years ago in Texas, there was a little girl that fell down in a well, in a well. And some of you remember that as really the nation was very concerned about this little girl and for 48 hours, crews tunneled in seeking to not collapse the ground around that. And they had to be very careful the way that they went down in order to save this two-year-old. And praise God, she was saved from that. Think about the Chilean miners. Do you remember the miners that were stuck so far down underneath the ground? And the whole world watched as another new hole was bored down into the ground and a special capsule was hastily made as an emergency capsule that would come up and bring them up one by one. And some of you remember that night that they were coming out of the ground and the joy that was there of those rescues that were successful. Well, the rescue that goes beyond all rescues is the rescue that we celebrate at Christmas. It's the rescue of a holy God in his mercy and in his grace when he would be justified to turn and walk away from the creation that he has made. He in love and in mercy imparts a tremendous rescue. I want you to see here in the box on the page there, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, which is really our launch verse for this message that says this trust, 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying, the saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance. Now that's a load of thought right there. The Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, this is very, very important what I'm about to say to you. And then look at the second line. 
that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Can you underline that? That Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then the Apostle Paul would go on to write, of which I am the foremost. You see, one of the indicators that a sinner has been saved is that he has humility. And we see in this that the Apostle Paul looks down deep into his own heart. This is the great Apostle Paul that would be the great missionary of all time. Uh, It would seem that journey after journey through peril and through hardship, through beatings, and eventually would lose his head, would say, I am the foremost sinner, but we have a foremost Savior. Last Sunday, we looked at a very important aspect of Christian theology. If you were here with us last Sunday, we saw this, and I want you to review with me some things here and be ready to fill these in as we quickly run through it. We saw why, circle the word word why, why the virgin birth is such an important part of God's work in bringing salvation to his people. We acknowledge that very often, if that's not explained to us, we just kind of think it's awkward to talk about that at church. I remember that. So many of you were this week related to me that very same thing. You said, Pastor, I, I felt the same way as a kid growing up, or I felt the same way even now. Um, that I've never really understood why that is such a critical aspect of what we believe. And those of you who are still wondering, look at the review here. God broke the chain of what? Inherited sin. Where did that inherited sin come from? Adam and Eve and your grandmother and your grandmother. Don't you dare call my grandmother and grandfather sinners. They are sinners. And they pass their sin along to you. As in every generation, Psalm 51 says, it was in sin that we were conceived. God broke the chain of inherited sin when the Holy Spirit caused Mary to conceive the Christ child. It was not only a sign, but it was also God rescuing us. Jesus became the, say these words with me, Jesus became the sinless, perfect sacrifice. You see, that was absolutely necessary. I can't die for Larry. I'm not, I'm not sinless. Larry can't die for me. He's not sinless. We need a sinless sacrifice to fully pay for our sin. And that is God looks around and says, who can do it? Oh, only I can do it. Um, he didn't actually say that, but I want us to see this idea that, that he became the sinless, perfect sacrifice who took God's wrath on the cross and paid for the sins of his people. And look at the last sentence there. In his first coming, he was characterized as the suffering servant. In his first coming, Jesus was characterized as the suffering servant. In his second coming, he will be coming as the triumphant victor. Now, he's triumphant when he overcomes sin in the grave, but we see that his life and we see that his death that does end in victory, nevertheless, we see the tremendous suffering servant of who that is. So here here we see an important aspect of the Christmas truth, of the incarnational truth of God, but now we come to this great mission and we see why and what Christ had come to do. Look with me at at number one that we see here. At Christmas, Christians celebrate the incarnation. Important word, incarnation. Every, Every Christmas we emphasize that. I want you to understand this. This is a theological term. Um, It is the becoming of flesh. This is when God becomes flesh. He is the Son of God, or also called the Son of Man, one showing his deity, the other one showing his full humanity that we looked at last week. So the incarnation is the Son of God, or Son of Man, which began the greatest rescue mission of all time. There is no other rescue mission that has ever been done in human history that would come remotely close, whether for an individual or whether for a nation. This one was for the world. 
Now, I want you to see some passages of Scripture that are very clear about this. I want you to notice these. I have A, B, and C that are here. The first one I want you to see is that Christ came to seek those who are lost. Christ came to seek those who are lost. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to, underline it, seek and to save that which was lost. Now, we know that from what Jesus has often said in the parables and in teaching, that he often related his mission on earth as a shepherd dealing with a flock of sheep. And so when we see Luke 19 and verse 10, we need to think lost sheep. We need to think about this idea that, there, that there's a, a, sh- a, a lamb that is, that is separated from the fold, when they get back and they count all of them, the shepherd recognizes one of them is missing. I'm going to go get it. And so he goes to seek and to save that sheep that is lost. Letter B, Christ came not only to seek those who are lost, but Christ came to save those who are condemned. He came to save those who are condemned. And we just read this passage from 1 Timothy 1.15. You've already heard it. Let's read it out loud together. Let's read this, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, where it says the saying. Let's read together. The saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. So here's the Here's the huge saying that Paul is declaring that why did he come? He came to save sinners. Now, that idea of sinners is the condemned. It literally, the the, the word that we want to focus on here is sinners, those who miss the mark, those who miss the glory of God. And so they are condemned in their sin, and he comes to save them out of their condemnation. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 17. Now, we often quote John 3, 16, and you know that it says these words. If, you've, if you're not familiar with that, listen to the verse, and I'll just say it to you. It is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The very next verse says this, For God did not send his son into the world to do what? To condemn the world, but what does it say? To save the world through him. So Jesus' work, Jesus' life, his mission was that by which God would save the world. I I find it very comforting and very encouraging to me that Jesus, the high king of heaven, does not come to condemn. Jesus comes to save. Why does he not come to condemn? Important note here for you to see. The important note is this. Jesus did not come to condemn the world because it already stood condemned due to its sinful state before a holy God. And so we see that Jesus came that he may rescue God's people from their state of condemnation. Letter C. I want you to see this. Christ came, very important, Christ came to exchange himself for those who are in bondage. You may want to put out to the side of bondage the ones that have been um, kidnapped or the ones that are being held um, in captivity. So notice this. He comes to exchange himself. And, and notice Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 through 28. In verse 26 it says, It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, verse 28, here's this beautiful key that we see here. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And then look what it says, 
and to give his life as a what? A ransom. Circle the word ransom. Don't turn your sheet over yet. I want you to notice this. That he comes and he is exchanging his life for the lives of those who are being held captive. He comes and he's giving himself for them. Now, if you would, just notice the screen in front of you. Notice these that we've just said, A, B, and C. Let's read them out loud together. Are you ready? A, Christ came to seek those who are lost. Letter B, Christ came to save those who are condemned. Letter C, Christ came to exchange himself for those who are in bondage. So here, here are these operative pictures of what Jesus came to do. But notice the next part here. The way that I've worded this is seeking to be faithful to the function of Jesus. It, letter A does not say Christ came to seek those who were lost, but because they are lost. Because you see, Christ still is saving people today. It wasn't over and it wasn't finished in all of the mission of God to all generations only in Christ in this sense, that he is still bringing people out of the finished work of Christ on the cross when he said it is finished and he gave up, his go gave up the ghost and he died for our sins. Indeed, the ransom was paid. But what is so interesting is that the beautiful picture that generation after generation after generation, God is calling people to himself. God is still saving his people. That those who are condemned, you see, there's people here to, in, in, not only in this room, but all around the world around us, that they're sitting there and they have the weight of the condemnation of the sin on their shoulders. Some feel it and see it and know it very, very well. And others simply feel lost in their sin. They simply feel disjointed and very, very unfulfilled. And others recognize that they are in bondage. They have tried everything to stop this issue of anger or this issue of hatred or this issue of unforgiveness or this issue of vice. And they find themselves in bondage to this. That is all around us. And so Christ is saving sinners even today. He is saving the lost, he's saving the condemned, and he's saving those who are in bondage through what he did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Safe to turn your sheet over, look at number two. So at Christmas, the first one is that we should celebrate the incarnation, but number two, at Christmas, Christians can see Christians can see by his example, and they can hear by his words, and they can join by his invitation, Christ's mission. It's very interesting how interactive our God is. Our God does not say, I'm going to come and do this, and everyone is in every way passive all around my salvation. It's very interesting that our interactive God says, only I can provide your salvation. There is no question of that, but I work in you, and I work with you, and I come to work, listen to this, through you in the lives of others. We have an interactive God, and this cannot be denied from the gospel. From the very beginning with Adam and Eve and from the very beginning through the works of Abraham and through the works of Noah, through the works of Joseph, through the works all the way through the Bible, we see that this God is an interactive God working and moving and showing his glory as he moves in us. And so even here, when it comes to the great mission of Christ, while I can't die for someone's sins, I can tell someone, someone died for your sins. And God uses the one who shares the good news. Look with me in John chapter 17 and verse 18. 
we see that this is Jesus' prayer to the Father, and this is at the Last Supper. You see, this is the night before he's going to the cross. This is the night before the great mission that he's been given to do is about to take a major step forward that he has been proclaiming the truth of God, and now he's going to live out the truth of God, of God's grace, as he goes to the cross for the sins of sinners. And so at the Last Supper, this is what he prays to the Father. He's saying, Father, sanctify them by the truth, the truth that he's been proclaiming. Your word is truth. That's his promise. The fact that he promised a Messiah, he promised that he would bring salvation. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. Can you underline that last part of that? I have also sent them. We see that over that three-year ministry of Jesus, that he is showing the disciples that God is going to use them in the salvation process of the world. And not just the disciples, but all those who would claim the name of Christ. Friends, that means you and me. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 21. Jesus sends out his followers just before, fill it in, returning to heaven. So this is a short time later, after he has risen from the dead, after he has shown himself to his disciples and to those who would believe in him, he gathers them together on a hill outside of the city that is there, and he says, I am going away, and I am commissioning you to tell the world what I have done. Look what he says there. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now, Christians need to recognize John 17 and John 20. Christians need to recognize that just like Jesus was sent on the mission, that we too are sent on the same mission. Our role is different, but we are on the same mission that God is saving the world for his glory through himself And listen, it's through his people. Now, if I was God, I wouldn't have done it this way. I wouldn't trust y'all. I wouldn't trust myself. If I was God, I would say, y'all, use guys, wherever. I mean, you you can't do it. And, you know, I, I just don't, I don't have the faith and the patience and the goodness of God in that. But God, in his infinite mercy, and it is infinite wisdom. Knowing what brings him the most glory, God has chosen to show how merciful and how gracious, and listen, how relational and interactive he is by including us in the glory of bringing glory to himself. What a glorious picture, and so many times we miss the mission So many times we think it's just, you know, it's just about I don't feel good and I just kind of need God to take some of this burden. And There's many who come and perhaps never even truly hear the gospel, never even truly understand the transforming power of conversion to faith in Jesus instead of ourselves. And they're just looking for some relief and they've never yet really found it. Or there are some who have found the relief of salvation in Christ but they go on to live pretty miserable Christian lives. And part of the reason is because they're not recognizing that God calls us to be obediently on mission with him. God calls us to join him. We get all afraid, what will people think? And I'll say something that's wrong, or I'll misrepresent, or I'm kind of a hypocrite. How can I even say anything? We, we give all of these excuses instead of just looking at the plain instructions of God by faith. You see, we need to recognize that even in our weaknesses, that God proclaims his glory. And if we will simply obey, if we will simply look in faith to what he said about our sin and the forgiveness that he gives us and what he wants to do, listen, what he wants to do through us, if we will begin to hold on to that, we'll be able to see something. Now, notice the next passage that is here. It's coming from 2 Corinthians. And really, 2 Corinthians could almost be 3 Corinthians. There's a, me- there's a letter there that's missing. Um, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit didn't want us to have it. Um, but you remember with me, in the first letter of Corinthians, and in the missing 
second letter, or 1A, there was a great deal of rebuke leveled upon the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, they claimed Christ, but they lived like the world. And there were many of them that weren't even saved that were in the church. You know, that's a real problem when a church just welcomes the lost with no conversion to faith in Christ, no proclamation of faith, no changed life, no transformed life, and we just call everybody the church because everybody will feel better about that, and, and you know, we don't want to be exclusive or anything like that. And so the idea is, is that, we, that we just kind of, doesn't really matter what you really believe, doesn't really matter the way you really live, sure, if you're in the church, you're in the church. Well, the Corinthian church did that, and it wasn't very long before sin was rampant throughout the church. They're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. The poor needs are not being met. The widows are not being met. There's great immorality. There's people sleeping with each other's mother-in-laws. I mean, it is a mess. It's a very worldly church. And the Apostle Paul rebukes them soundly. And he sends with Titus, who we just studied this last year, he sends a letter with Titus to go into, wouldn't you like to have been Titus on that one, delivering this letter of rebuke? And he even pushed it to the point where the letter was heard. And do you know what the response of many of the Corinthians was? Repentance. Many of the Corinthians realized that they lived like the world, that they were no different, that they continued in sin like the world. Oh, they went to church, but they were not involved with the kingdom of God. They were involved with their own kingdom. And so this is Paul recommissioning, as it were, the Corinthians after rebuke, and I could write out there to the side, and repentance. So they apparently had repented. Now look at verse 18. This is beautiful. He's telling them, he's saying to them in this letter, look at what all God has done and look what he invites you to do. Look at verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and then underline this, and then did what? And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Verse 19 is incredibly important for your basic soteriology or your understanding of salvation. Look at what verse 19 says. It is through Christ that God was bringing the world back to himself or bringing his people back to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. So here we are in league with Jesus. He's the sinless sacrifice that pays for our sin. We are the proclaimers. Look at verse 20. Therefore, we are what? I love it. Ambassadors for Christ. Circle those three words. Ambassadors for Christ. I just ask you, do you understand that if you're a Christian, you are an ambassador for Christ? You are a spokesman for Christ? Think about what an ambassador does when he goes to a foreign land. When he goes to a foreign land, he has the authority of his government behind him, and he is the one that speaks on behalf of that kingdom or on behalf of that country, that nation. And here, God is saying, we speak on the behalf of Christ. I love the next part. It's even more intense. God making his appeal, what? Through us. What a glorious picture that God is so interactive with us. He calls us to his kingdom. He calls us to be involved in him. He calls us to even be his spokesman and the one who would appeal and look what he says here at the end of that. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, part of that is not only be saved, but part of that is be reconciled to the ministry that God has given you. You see, there's many, perhaps in this room, that need to say, wow, I need to embrace what God has given me to do. And some of you would say, well, I, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm not very educated, or I'm not good with words, or I'm not, you know, I don't have much status and position, or I, I'm poor, and I, I just don't have, or my health is bad. How can I be God's spokesman? How can God make any appeal through me? 
Oh, my dear friends, just go read your Bible and see how God works through the weak. You see, God can't work through the prideful. He chooses not to. In fact, typically what he does with them is simply humble them. But here we see that God is calling us to embrace the ministry of reconciliation. This is part of what faith is. This is part of what Christians do as they move forward in faith and say, God, do your thing in me and do your thing through me. Oh, the glorious picture of God's grace that even with Christians who had messed up, have you messed up? Are you weak? Have you been foolish? Come like the Corinthians back to the message of the gospel and see that God is calling you to embrace his work in the world. The last one I want you to see here is Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 16. The Lord just laid this on my heart because it, it's, it's very different than the other three that are here. But just kind of think with me for a moment. You may want to make a note out there to the side. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, the, chapter 5 is a low number, by the way. Um, there, um, this is the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. And so this is, means that this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the Sermon on the Mount is that sermon where Jesus says, you know, you say, um, don't murder, but I say, if you're angry with your brother, you've murdered him already. You say, don't commit adultery, but I say, if you have lust in your heart, you've already slept with him or you've already slept with her. You see, Jesus is just totally blowing all of the preconceived ideas out of the water. And he's saying to them, you want to know what real godliness looks like? This is what real godliness looks like. God is after the heart. He's always after the heart. There's a lot of people in cultural Christianity that think that, you know, God, you know if I look good, smell good, kind of do what I'm supposed to do, you know, that certainly God will will look upon me and he will accept me and others around me will accept me and I'll have some status. But no, Jesus blows all the religiosity out of the water. I hope that Sheridan Hills increasingly has no interest in religiosity. Listen, we're all broken in need of a savior. We're all messed up. We've all got our problems. Every family has its issues. Every single one of them. That's why Jesus died for us. And he died to heal us. He died to reconcile us. He died to come and soothe the pain that the world cannot soothe. And so Jesus is saying, you want to know what this really looks like? You see, Jesus des describes his true followers and what they will do if they know him. And look what it says in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and, get, and it gives light to all who are in the house. He's saying, how foolish would it be to light a candle and just put a, a shade, you know, a, a blocker, a light blocker over it? You would never do that. Or you put a torch out in the street to help the city have light at night at a well or at some crucial point, and then just put a basket over it and hide the light. You would never do that. It, it, it completely goes against the purpose of lighting the light. And Jesus say, is saying, you would never do that. If you're really my follower, here's what it is. Look at verse 16. In the same way important phrase, in the same way, let your light shine before the others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. See, so your holiness does matter. The way you live does matter. It does matter whether or not you live a righteous life before God in repentance and brokenness, depending upon the power of His Spirit to give you the strength to do what He's called you to do. It does matter that we live in a way that is in keeping with His commands. But here, in these four verses, notice the four verses that are there. He's saying... As you sent me into the world, I send them into the world. Verse 20, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
Embrace the ministry of reconciliation, even in your brokenness. And Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5, if you're really mine, there's going to be a light that is going to give light to a lost and dying world. Now, number two has been Christmas. At Christmas, Christians can see Jesus' example. We can hear his words of invitation, and we can join him by those words of invitation. I remember the night that I came home from Crescent Beach Baptist Church, and I said to Marcy, I think the Lord is calling us to leave. He spoke to me on the way home from church that night, and we had such great leaders that we had a kind of a big meeting that was important, going over some new things, and I had hardly said anything. The men and the women were so together and so good. It, it was no longer a new work. It was no longer a new church. And it was like God was saying, now's the time for you to go to the mission field. And I said it to Marcy, and Marcy said, well, that's really interesting because he spoke to me two weeks ago. You know, very often the women are ahead of us, guys. <laughs> Not always, sometimes, fine, but very often the women are ahead of us. You see that Mrs. Pepper, that she was already wondering when he was going to be ready. I want you to notice something here in number three. I want you to notice that at Christmas, this whole missional nature of Jesus' mission to the earth, at Christmas, Christians should evaluate their lives. Now, I know that we're all sugared up. And I know that there's lights everywhere. And I know there's long to-do lists. And I know that there's lots of expectations and lots of obligations. And there's lots of annoyances in this time of year. Lots of joy in this time of year. But listen, we should not look at the manger and look at the incarnation and not see the broader picture we as Christians should look at what God has done and we should say, Lord, speak. Now, I think that it is incumbent upon every human being to ask continually, letter A, am I really a Christian? It's okay for Christians to ask, am I really a Christian? In fact, Peter says, test yourselves to see that you're in the faith. You would hate to be wrong about that. And we can be deceived. In fact, I think that there are many, many evangelicals in America that are very deceived about their salvation. Look, we need to look at the texts of the Bible that talk about the wheat amidst the tares, or the tares amidst the wheat. That means those who look like Christians who aren't. That talks about the sheep amidst the goats. Those who do not know his voice. Many will say unto me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not, did I not, did I not? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you, because your heart was never made new by the Savior. You see, we need to really ask ourselves, do I really, am I really a Christian? And here's a key part of that. Have I been made new? Have I been made new? Because that's what a true Christian is. You put out there to the side, to be reborn. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, Nicodemus, unless you're reborn, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, what are you talking about? I can't enter into my mother's womb again. That, that's, that's crazy. What do you mean by that? And Jesus is saying, you, you, you're born once of a human life. You're born once of water, but you're born again spiritually through the grace of God. And that is absolutely essential. I think Christians need to, and here's another way to ask this, am I really a Christian? Do I live in repentance? Do I live in repentance? Do I, do I live constantly turning back to God? Do, is that characterization of my life? How about this, do I live in worship? You see, worship isn't just singing. Worship isn't just done at 10.30 on Sunday morning. Worship is the way that we speak at home and the way that we work. Oh my, the way we drive, the way we do everything. And, you know, it's that desire to, mm, 
and worship says, no, I'll just pray for them. (laughs) Worship is, do I live in faith? Do I really live in faith in God? You see, here's a key question. If you're, if you're asking the thing, am I really a Christian, you need to really, I think every Christian should, should do this. Does sin rule over me, or does Christ rule over me? Which one rules over my heart? How we need to ask this. And in fact, I, I, would, I would desire that you would not leave here today without really considering this and speaking with one of the pastors or one of the people that's near you. There's many people in this room right here that would be glad to, to pray with you. They, and they would maybe even be glad to sit and, and say, well, I want to ask the same question. And that's okay. I, in the bookstore, there are two books that I would recommend if this is the issue for you at all. The first one is, Am I Really a Christian? by Mike McKinney. And that, that's, a, that's a great question. This, every Christian ought to have this book. I, I want to encourage you. It, don't just think, oh, can you believe that, that John bought that book? He must not be saved. Oh, listen, <laughs> that attitude is probably the attitude of somebody going to hell. The attitude is, oh, wow, great, got that. That's cool. Maybe, maybe he'll find either affirmation or he'll find the Savior. There's another book that we read for men's boot camp a while back, Conversion. This is a great, simple, very, you, see it, you can almost see through it. It's a very, very small book that really looks at how do you know that you know that you know that Christ is your Savior. See, I, I think that Christians should evaluate their lives. Look at letter B. We should ask this question as we saw Larry Pepper asking this question. Am I on Christ's mission or am I on my own mission? You see, Larry Pepper had to answer that question. Am I really doing what God wants me to do? And for him, God was saying, I have another. You see, there's the businessman or there's the the college-age young woman or there's the teacher, or there is the accountant, or there is the bus driver, and and, uh, every, all the way through this room, we have different jobs, and we have different skills, and we have different things that God can use all over the world, and sometimes it's not even to become a missionary in the vocational sense. Sometimes it's because a data programmer can live in Dubai and build friends with people who will never hear the gospel if there's not another data programmer that's there who can do that. Or there's the teacher that all she has to do is just kind of learn maybe some new things and perhaps a little bit a different language. And because she's a teacher, she can go live in Central Asia because they really need teachers. There's the nutritionist who recognizes that in out the outskirts of India, that there's, there's great nutritional problems because people have never been trained in nutrition. I know this because my own sister went to India as a nutritionist, and she wrote a little book for Indian women based upon their diet of those who were pregnant, what they could begin to put as part of their diet so that they would have a healthy pregnancy as opposed to just staying with the things that are the main staples that don't fill all of the need. And she was sharing Christ all the way along. My friends, am I on Christ's mission or am I on my own mission? Look at letter C. Does Christ own my time? Is he in charge of my time? Is he in charge of my talents? That's my abilities. How about this one? Is he in charge of my treasure? You say, I don't have any treasure. You people have treasure? Oh no, you have treasure. We all have treasure. And the question is, does Christ own my time, my talents, and my treasure? Notice the hint here, if you're wondering the answer to that, just go look at your checkbook. Because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So just go look at where you spend your money. Is your money part of God's mission, 
or are you just on your own mission spending it all on yourself? Do you, do you give a tip to God? You know, 20 bucks here, five bucks there. Oh, yeah, I give. Or are you involved with his kingdom work through your giving? That's a, that's a key issue. That, you know, that's, that's an issue that Jesus spoke a lot about. What about letter D? Here's a key question. When was the last time I made a decision that required faith? I'm not talking about forced into something, but I'm talking about that God was prompting you to do something, and you said, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but God is calling me to do this, and I have to trust him. You see, this is a good way for Christians, this is a good time for Christians to evaluate our lives. I want to give you three very quick things that at Christmas we should renew. Um, Notice this, we should renew our commitment to missions at Christmas. Why? Because this is the greatest mission that the universe has ever known. When you look at the manger scene, when you look at the shepherds coming, when you look at the angels dealing with Mary and Joseph and the wise men and all of the visions and the dreams, and when you look at God working through this incredible, beautiful story, we should renew our commitment to missions because this is the greatest mission of all. Letter A, we should renew our commitment to pray fervently for lost people. Jesus has told us to pray. And we see that God is glorified when we are praying. In fact, when the church in Acts would really pray, the place would shake and thousands would come to faith. Do we really pray? Do we pray in our homes? When we pray as a church, do we really pray together? When have we ever prayed enough? That's always convicting to me. And we need to pray for the people that are locally and that that live next door. This is part of the reason with your community groups that we've offered to you, we begged you to come get the list of your neighbors so you can just pray for your neighbors that live around your house, locally and globally, overseas. How about letter B? Another way that we can renew our commitment to missions is to give sacrificially so that missionaries can stay. If we don't give, the missionaries will have to come home. We've already had to bring home a lot of missionaries because missions giving was not where it needed to be. About four years ago, we had to bring home a thousand missionaries. Southern Baptists had to bring home a thousand missionaries. How many? Think about that. We have enough money in Southern Baptist churches. If we would all give sacrificially, we could send 10,000 more next week. It's a very small amount in comparison to the grand scheme of things. When you think about how much you spend on dinner and how much you spend on on gas and how much you spend on vacation and how much you spend on everything else, if we would just give in accordance with other things that are around us, if we would say, you know, I'm going to say no to some things so I can do more here. Because this is God's kingdom. I, I want to, you know, you can't outgive God, so I'm going to test him. Malachi says, test him. See if he will not pour out a blessing you can't receive. How many of you have tried Malachi 3? Try Malachi 3. See if God will not pour out a blessing. I, t- I can tell you that, that the Lord has provided for Marcy and I over and over and over again when we said, wow, this could be a lot. How are we going to give that? Let's do it, and God provides. Friends, notice this, that the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and that's a major part of this message because it's so important to us, but there's, as you've seen this morning, there's a whole much more than this, but the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions, this, this offering 
keeps 3,700 missionaries on the field. That's our current level, 3,700 missionaries. Sheridan Hill's goal is 55,000 this year. And y'all, we have, I think, about 3,600 bucks. So we got a long way to go. But I, wanted, I want you to see, look at the goal for all of the IMB, all of the 46,000 Baptist churches in, in, the, in the United States. It's 160 million. Now that 160 million, that is half of the IMB's budget, the International Mission Board's budget. That is half of the entire budget for the entire year. So if we will give sacrificially at Christmas, if churches will respond to messages like this all over the United States, and we give $160 million to that, listen, our missionaries will be able to stay, and we'll be able to add more missionaries. Notice this, and you've, some of you are new to us, and our, the, our beautiful friends from Manitoba, Canada, they're wondering, why is this little lady on the stage? And I understand. And maybe you, somebody invited you to church, and you're going, what in the world? Why in the world do they have this little lady in a... You know, this is, the, this is the 100th year of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. She died, Lottie Moon was a, was a missionary in China, she died 105 years ago. But five years after she died, the WMU, the Women's Missionary Union, got together in the United States and they said, let's name our missions offering after Lottie. And that was done a hundred years ago this year. So that's what this lady means. In fact, she starved to death so that the people that she was reaching would have food in the midst of a famine in China. Died on a ship outside of Kobe, Japan. She kept writing letters before she died. Please send more missionaries. Please send more funds. Please, please give so that your missionaries can go. Please, we need, the people are open to listening to the gospel. It's hard, but they're open. If we can send more, please send more. Please, out of all of your wealth in America, please continue to give. That's why they named the offering after her, because she was an advocate for people to give and people to go. And that brings me to the last one. Would we go? Would we go to the nations? You say, what about the nation? What about the people across the street? Would we go to the people that live next door? Would we go to the people that don't fold anything over? Look at this. Go boldly as God calls and you obey. You pray first and then you go. I believe that there's some in this room that God's calling you to go, to go get trained and go preach the gospel. There's others of you that God is calling you to incorporate that into your life, that you say, I'm gonna be a goer. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna drive down into the school district. Or I'm gonna drive down into the business world. Or I'm gonna drive down into the hospital world. Or I'm gonna drive down into the, into the hotel world. And I'm just gonna be the light of Christ. And I am so grateful for people in our church that are making decisions yesterday I ran into somebody at Costco, and we sat there and had a hot dog together, and this guy was telling me, we've made some decisions. We cut cable. We don't even have cable television anymore. Don't need that. We, we've made this decision. We've made that decision. I don't want to, I'm going to retire as soon as I can so I can spend more time serving God. I praise God that there's people making decisions. I met with somebody a few weeks ago, and they said, Pastor Andrew, we are selling our house. We live a long way from church, and we're just selling our house because we want to live close to the church just so that we can serve more here. Now, you don't have to sell your house and move close to the church in order to serve, but this person, this person is saying, I've, we just kind of feel led to do that. We want to be really available to the church family more and more and more to help with their lives. Friends, will we make radical decisions of faith? I want to challenge you to evaluate your life at Christmas. I want to challenge you to renew your commitment to the greatest mission of all. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me for prayer?